Let's pray. Heavenly Father, teach us the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. I only remember specifics about a few of the, my birthday parties growing up. Um, we went to the Hungry Dutchman one time. It, it was an amazing restaurant. My family, they surprised me when I went to college. They drove all the way to Seward, Nebraska. Uh, then there was the time we went to the 94th Aero Squadron at the old Stapleton International Airport, one of my favorite places. One year, I actually didn't have a birthday. I left Honolulu on October 30th, and I arrived in Tokyo on November 1st. And, well, evidently I'm still a year older, but I missed a birthday that year. The rest kind of run together. What about you? What do you remember about your birthdays? Did you ever have a prophet of God killed on your birthday? Yeah, probably not, but that is what happens in our gospel lesson today. King Herod, officially known as Herod Antipas, which literally means not my father, or this Herod and not that Herod, is part of the infamous family of Herods, each trying to outdo the other by being the meanest, nastiest, most self-absorbed ruler. Our story starts with this Herod going to Rome on vacation. He falls in love with his brother's wife, who has better political connections. He um, divorces his current wife, marries Herodias, which makes her Herodias Herod, and he takes her home and makes her the new queen. John the baptizer told Herod, God said this was a really big no-no. Herod took it in stride. Herodias was furious, and she set out to kill John. Now, this Herod had a bit of a conscience, and he actually put Herod I mean, he actually put John in jail to protect him from Herodias. St. Mark notes this Herod actually liked listening to John preach, at least as much as you can like, a bug-eating, um, camel hair wearing prophet who consistently speaks inconvenient truths about you and your new wife. So with John in protective custody, Herod throws a big birthday party for himself. He invites the generals and all the rich and the famous. He spared no expense. The wine and the food were flowing freely, and after the wine had, well, really taken effect, this Herod's new stepdaughter, who, by the way, is also his niece, she gets up and dances. Now, we don't know if she was doing the bunny hop or the chicken dance or the macarena, but she made quite the splash with all the men in the audience. Now, as often happens when you are drinking and not thinking, this Herod impresses his guests by promising this young lady anything she wants, up to one half of his kingdom. She runs back to mommy and says, what should I ask for? And mommy says, without any hesitation, the head of John the Baptist on a platter. This Herod felt really bad because he liked John, but a promise is a promise. So he orders his soldiers to bring John's head on a platter, and they do, which depending on the type of people at the party, either means the buffet is closed and the party's over, or the buffet has a new centerpiece and the party is just beginning. And sadly enough, I'm pretty sure it was the latter, based upon what we're reading. Now for us, this story is about speaking the truth and doing the right thing, even when it might cause you to lose your head. You see, this Herod was so worried about what other people thought of him. Because of his oath and his guests, he willingly and knowingly killed a prophet of God. It says two things about him. First, he chose the wrong people to impress. And second, whatever soul he may have had left was now gone. John lost his head but gained eternal life. Herod had a great party but lost his soul. So do you remember D.C.E. Kayla's cakey message last week? How Jesus told his disciples not to take anything on their journey except the clothes on their back, the shoes on their feet, and a walking stick? Jesus also said, you know, people don't like your message. If people reject you, just walk away and shake the dust off your feet. See, it turns out we don't need the approval of people, especially those people who do not value love and forgiveness and mercy and grace and truth. Losing face, being rejected, having people think you're crazy, losing your head, well, it all hurts. But it can't hurt or take away the things that really matter, like the truth of God and eternity in heaven. Now, this sounds like a message that this Herod needed to hear. In fact, it's a message that all of us need to hear uh, because this same thing is played out every day through politics, churches, and businesses that are more interested in feeling good and being popular than following the truth of God. 
So think about those who divorce someone to marry someone else who has better connections or is younger or prettier. Have you ever been angry at somebody who spoke what you know is the truth about you and to you? Ever said or done something to get a laugh without really stopping to think who it might hurt? And doubling down on a lie to save face? Well, let's face it, that's way too common. Life and the news often echo our gospel lesson today. So Herod was not some soulless atheist that had never heard of God. He liked listening to John preach. And while God promises that my word always accomplishes the task for which I sent it, well, Herod made sure that God's word never got to take root in his heart. Remember the parable of the sower where some of the seed falls on sidewalks and places, you know, that have shallow soil and the birds either eat it or, you know, the, it starts to grow up. But since it can't, you know, root and, and find water and, and nutrients, it dies. Yeah. Herod may have liked John, but he made sure God's word never took root. And so we begin to see the parable of the sower lived out in Herod's life. So months after John loses his head, this Herod is told there's a new preacher going around who's healing people and casting out demons and causing quite the religious stir. And this Herod assumes it is John the Baptist back from the dead. Now, whether this is wishful thinking, in other words, Herod thinking that John found a way to reattach his head and he was going to have new sermons to listen to, or whether he had a really guilty conscience, we're not really sure, but he's definitely bothered by this. So do you know anybody like Herod? Somebody who did unspeakable, terrible things and then has to live with those sins the rest of their life. I love the song by Coldplay, Viva La Vida. The most poignant lyrics for me are, For some reason I can't explain, I know St. Peter won't call my name. It's easy to think that we can't be forgiven, that we crossed a line. But the gospel says that's not the way that God works. There is nothing that Herod or anyone can do that is so terrible that they cannot be forgiven except to deny God and His Spirit in your dying breath. Every Good Friday, I think about Judas. He agrees to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. The Bible says that Judas used to borrow money from the church account. And it doesn't say what he spent it on, but let's face it, there's always things for us to get addicted to, no matter who we are or where we are. The Bible also hints that Judas didn't know that they were going to kill Jesus. And when he found out, he tries to return the money, but they won't take it back, even after he says, look, I have betrayed innocent blood. I can't go through with this. And when it came down to the final breath of his life, Judas tries to save himself instead of letting Jesus save him. And that was his only real mistake. See, the greatest tragedies in this life are when people go to their grave having no idea just how much God really loves them, that he sent his son to redeem them so that they do not have to live in fear or hopelessness or darkness all the days of their life. Now, despite his crown, this Herod isn't any different than the prostitutes, tax collectors, divorcees hanging out at the well, gamblers, soldiers, Samaritans, pig farmers, or prodigal children that we read about in the Bible. He's not any different from them except when these sinners found themselves in the presence of God and were given a glimpse of God's bigger story of mercy and grace through the cross. Their eyes and heart were open to the truth of who they really were. See, Jesus wrote a new ending to their story. He gave them new meaning for their life. They had to endure hearing the uncomfortable hard truth. It's never easy to hear those things about us. But it freed them to live a very different life with a totally different ending from that moment on. Oh, it was not a perfect life. It was simply a life covered in grace. Ever feel like your life story is inescapable? I hear people all the time say that they can't change. Some say it pretty proudly. Others say it hopelessly. We can get so caught up in the events around us and the identity that we created for ourselves or that we have allowed others to force upon us that we cannot see ourselves as anything but what we were. This is why some people come to church to find out if there still might be hope for them. And by the way, if you are waiting for me to announce the gospel from our gospel lesson today, I'll be honest, I didn't find any, at least specifically within the verses in our lesson. 
See, when I looked up the rest of Herod's story in secular history, this is what I found. You remember this Herod's first wife, you know, the one that he dumped for Herodias? Well, she was the daughter of King Eratos. Now, that king did not take kindly to Herod making his little girl cry. And so he declared war on Herod, and he made Herod's life miserable. And a lot of people died, and Caesar was not happy. Then when Caesar died, there was a scuffle over the throne. And a little birdie, who, by the way, just happened to be Herod's nephew, who obviously wasn't happy with it, told Caligula, who became the new Caesar, that Herod had enough weapons for 70,000 soldiers and was not devoted to the Roman Empire. Caligula took away all of Herod's power and riches and gave them to that little birdie and then banished Herod and Herodias to a backwater town where they were supposed to live in misery for the rest of their lives. So it's time for a how well did you pay attention quiz. Did you notice who was only mentioned once, very casually, in the first sentence, and then completely left out of the entire rest of our gospel lesson? This is the only story in Mark's gospel where Jesus is not the central character. Now, considering the gospels are the story of Jesus, and the word gospel means good news, this sounds a little strange, or does it? If Herod's story was not in the Bible, if it was a secular biography or historical novel, it would be a bestseller, even with the depressing ending. There would even be those who would idolize King Herod, saying, you know, he was that close to having it all. But was he? Is it enough to gain the whole world if you lose your soul, paraphrasing Jesus? I would like to have been there in Gaul during Herod's final days asking him if he had any regrets, any confessions. It really is never too late until the person takes their last breath. I wonder if anybody sat with him, if anybody ministered to him. Many years ago, Nancy wanted me to watch a movie she liked. It was called The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. It's a cute movie. But the part that I remembered best was where one of the characters says, In India, we have a saying, In the end, all will be well. If it is not well, it is not yet the end. It was not a good ending for Herod. But it can be and will be through Jesus for us. Herod exits stage left after this verse. We don't see him again until Jesus' crucifixion. But we do meet a man who's filled with demons and a, a dad whose daughter is dying and a woman who is ashamed of her past and a man who thinks he knows everything. And as they listen to Jesus tell the truth, their life story is transformed. And so even though there isn't any gospel in our specific verses today, that doesn't mean the gospel isn't there, because it is always there. Just as St. John promised, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Something else to note. Immediately following the death of John, the very next story in the Bible, Jesus steps up on a hillside and begins to preach. And the crowds are so amazed, so caught up in the sermon that they lose track of time until their stomachs are growling so loudly they can't ignore it anymore. And this time, instead of generals and the rich and the famous, although there could have been a few of them there, it's the lost and the diseased and the hurting and the prodigals and the forsaken and the disowned that gather around God's table of love. A few loaves of bread, a couple of fish, feed everybody. And there's leftovers. And you know what that means? It means if somebody had not come out to listen to Jesus preach that day, but just happened to be walking by the area, they would have been fed as well. Think about what that means. See, these two events are intentionally connected. We see the worst that the world can offer and the best that God does offer. God offers more grace and mercy and love than the world needs, meaning there is always room for more sinners to be redeemed and have their life stories changed. Preachers are to tell the truth, whether it's a silence that speaks too loudly or the tragic truth of a man and his new wife who think they can conquer the world but wind up in a dark and echoing silence, or of a man who was willing to lose his head because if the truth is worth telling, then the truth is worth losing your head over. And John says Jesus' truth was worth it. 
When the Bible says the truth of God is a double-edged sword, it means it's impossible to stand on that razor-sharp edge. We have to fall to one side or the other, and only one of the sides has the grace of God. Between this Herod having John's head cut off and the moment Caligula banished him to that backwater town, Herod actually got to meet Jesus face to face. He asked Jesus to do some party tricks. And when Jesus refused, Herod sent him back to Pilate and said, I got no use for him. That's where Pilate asked Jesus a very important question. He says, so Jesus, what is truth? And Jesus doesn't say a word. He just stands there and keeps standing there. If any of the disciples would have been there, they would have gotten it. Jesus had said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Pilate didn't get the reference. You see, Jesus is the answer to the question. He is the truth of God. Like Herod, in order to make the crowds and his Roman bosses happy, Pilate kept his word and put Jesus to death, even though the Bible says that he too had doubts. Both Pilate and Herod, even old Judas, missed the kingdom of God by that much. And I would quote that old proverb there, but by the grace of God go I, but it's hard to get excited or take pleasure in someone else's loss, even if they were who they were. I wish their story had had a different ending. And maybe that's the whole point of our gospel lesson today, to look for those kind of people in our world who, like Herod, are just a little too into themselves and try to repeat this story from repeating itself. The truth is inconvenient, and most of us don't want to lose our heads. But wouldn't it be great if even just one of these folks discovered how much God loved them in the end, and their story got changed by the grace of God? We can be embraced by the truth only when we know that we are God's children, that we are of infinite value and eternally loved. When Jesus says you can have the world, he doesn't say and God. No, he says you can either have the world or God, but not both. I know that's hard to swallow, but there may be something behind the legend that old John the baptizer had a smile on his beheaded face when they put it on that platter and brought it back to Herod. You see, he knew something they didn't, and he hoped that that one last defiant act might help a few others know what he knew. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.